right, so let me tell you a bit about uh, what I have planned uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to start by setting the scene, just giving some uh, basic overview of uh, inequality uh, and define some of the terms, right? What actually do we mean when we say inequality? Specifically, what's the difference between inequality of outcome and inequality of opportunity? Um, I'll discuss uh, some research on uh, the effects of inequality, really the effects of income inequality on health uh, and how that's changing really in uh, populations like this, right, in the Northeast. Uh, in uh, largely rural areas, uh, what now is the relationship between income inequality and health? Uh, we'll dig into some numbers. Uh, I've brought some uh, statistics. You just heard that I teach social statistics, so I always have to have some statistics in a presentation. Uh, I brought some numbers specifically about Vermont, uh, uh, comparing uh, some income inequality, some wealth inequality measures uh, uh, across counties in our state. Um, I'll mention uh, a few things about higher education, talking about some uh, of the colleges and universities in the state. Um, my kind of real interest right now is on the relationship between uh, income inequality and higher education. Uh, so I hope to talk about that a bit. Uh, and then finally talk about some of the uh, policy proposals that are out there. We might just have to mention them very briefly uh, about uh, how to reduce uh, income inequality and generate more social mobility. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time uh, at the end for uh, your questions. Uh, this is a topic that I found, uh, in, oh, this is my third year now in Vermont, um, uh, compared to other places places where I've been uh, doing talks like this in Vermont, uh, I often end up with audiences who know a lot about income inequality. Right? Partly because uh, we have one senator who's been really good at talking about it. Uh, and I imagine that that is part of uh, some of your interest in coming here tonight. Uh, you know about the top 1%, you know about the billionaires. Uh, uh, and so putting that in some uh, more local, uh, national context is something that I want to do. Um, some of the sources, because I imagine this is a topic that some of you have been uh, very familiar with, uh, some of the sources might look uh, familiar to you. Um, I hope, none of, I hope uh, no one has seen all of the stuff that I will be uh, talking about. About tonight. Um, but just to give you a sense of some of the big uh, papers or research areas where I'm drawing some uh, inspiration for tonight, uh, either uh, in case something looks familiar to something you've seen before, uh, or if you want some more information later. Uh, the first is a series of uh, papers right now uh, making a lot of uh, news, catching a lot of attention by Raj Chetty and his colleagues. Uh, Raj Chetty is a professor of economics now at uh, Harvard. Uh, he was directing something called the Equality of Opportunity Project out at Stanford. Now that has moved with him uh, and his team to Harvard, and they've renamed themselves Opportunity Insights. The New York Times loves Raj Chetty and the Opportunity Insights Project. Um, so there are a couple things that I'll be showing you uh, that you might have seen already in the New York Times from, uh, 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 from their work. Uh, the Economic Policy Institute uh, has a really fantastic report out called The New Gilded Age, uh, looking at uh, income inequality across uh, lots of different parts of the country, right? So you can put in uh, Vermont, I'll, put, I'll show you some of the stuff from Vermont, or uh, a much uh, smaller, more restricted address uh, and be able to pull up lots of different inequality information as well. If you're interested in this topic, uh, I would certainly recommend looking there later. Uh, the Pew Research Center, I uh, love. I pull, lots of research, I pull lots of research and data from the Pew Research Research Center. Uh, income inequality is one of their main areas of focus, uh, but they also do work on crime and race. Uh, big data and technology uh, uh, is another big area uh, where they do work as well. Uh, and then inequality.org. Is anyone familiar with inequality.org? Uh, inequality.org is a really fantastic resource. They have a, a, a really brilliant weekly newsletter or every other week newsletter. Um, uh, if this is a topic that you are interested in, I would recommend uh, taking a look at that as well. Uh, the source that I usually like to start uh, talks like this with uh, is something in the news, right? Uh, some uh, kind of newspaper article that I saw, um, some social media article that I saw, uh, and it turned out that there were a lot of options right now uh, when it came to inequality. Uh, you are here tonight, which means that you are not at the Davos World Economic Forum, uh, which is beginning today in Switzerland. Uh, and there is uh, lots of different research uh, being presented there. Not all of it about inequality, unfortunately, um, but Oxfam is presenting one uh, new study of theirs uh, at the Davos World Economic Forum, which is somewhat ironic, right? Uh, 26 richest own as much as poorest 50%. Most of those 26 are probably at that conference, right? Uh, this is a gathering of uh, uh, billionaires, uh, government leaders, business leaders uh, who come together once a year to talk about uh, these issues. The last couple of years, they've really been focused on income inequality, uh, which is uh, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and so organizations are now going to Davos to be able to uh, talk about that research. Uh, I don't know if this next couple is in Davos right now. 
Uh, this is Jeff Bezos uh, and his wife, uh, his, his current wife, uh, Mackenzie Bezos. You might have heard that they are uh, in the process of uh, divorcing. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, discussion right now, uh, a lot of uh, questions about what this will mean both for his fortune and perhaps for her fortune. Uh, in the state of Washington, which is where Amazon is based and where the couple is based, uh, has one of those rules where if you divorce, uh, both people get uh, half of the fortune. Uh, if Mackenzie uh, Bezos gets half of Jeff Bezos's fortune, she would be in the top 10 on the uh, Forbes list of billionaires. Right? She would have about $60 billion just to her name. Uh, Jeff Bezos, by far, is the richest person uh, in the world, right? the first person to have uh, wealth above $100 billion. Just to give you a sense of how much she would have after this divorce, if they did, did decide to divide things evenly, she would have about the same as each of the Koch brothers. We think of the Koch brothers as having a lot of money. Uh, and Mackenzie Bezos would have that same amount uh, uh, if uh, they divorce. Uh, there's some spe suggestion right now, some speculation that inequality is going to be a big part of the 2020 election. Uh, Democrats are starting to uh, talk about uh, inequality much more. Uh, and there's also talk about some billionaires uh, running for president, some more billionaires running for uh, president. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren right now is really the one who is talking most about income inequality. Uh, Julian Castro is also talking about social mobility, uh, perhaps more than income inequality. Uh, the most recent candidates to announce, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, Kamala Harris, they've actually talked very little about income inequality. Uh, and one of the interesting things, I think, to watch about this race uh, will be that because Elizabeth Warren right now, and perhaps Bernie Sanders, uh, will be talking about income inequality so much, will that mean that other candidates don't? Um, will they kind of give up? up the income inequality topic uh, to Warren and perhaps uh, Sanders. Uh, you can imagine that we would have perhaps a much more robust conversation if everyone was talking about income inequality. Um, I'm not sure if that is going to happen this year. Uh, by the time we have a new president, maybe 2020, maybe 2024, um, maybe sooner, <laughs> who knows the way things, <laughs> the way things are going. Uh, perhaps by the next time we have a, uh, or by the time we have a new president, we might have an open government. Uh, for that president uh, to oversee. We don't have that quite yet. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, I think starting to be concern uh, about what this government shutdown is uh, uh, revealing about income inequality. Right? Um, the fact that uh, as of this coming Friday, there might be uh, 800,000 federal workers uh, who don't receive uh, the second paycheck that they were expecting. Right? Uh, I don't know about you. I know a lot of people uh, who would not be able to get by if they were missing two paychecks. Um, just to give you a sense of some national numbers, uh, some studies came out in the last couple of years uh, that show that about 40% of Americans have less than $400 in savings. Um, and something like two thirds of Americans uh, have less than $1,000 dollars in savings, right? Um, so when people need food, when they need childcare right now, and they're not getting paid for work that they're still supposed to be doing, uh, uh, that is telling us something about inequality. Um, that says nothing at all, right? That's just about the workers. Um, that's not uh, uh, really saying anything about the folks who uh, you might have seen in the New York Times today uh, in an article about uh, low-income renters uh, who rely on grants and subsidies from the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, to pay their rent. Right? Uh, they can't be getting those subsidies either. Um, so it is in these moments of chaos. It is when we have these external political and economic shocks uh, uh, that we tend to see uh, uh, what inequality is actually around us. Right? Uh, we don't always see it. We don't always notice it. Uh, but when there are these moments of crisis, uh, 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 there are things that uh, 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 are revealed much more clearly and much more starkly. Uh, for inequality researchers, uh, I often uh, uh, hear us joke uh, that we need to be careful what we wish for. Right? Uh, when it comes to inequality research right now, uh, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. Uh, there are lots of invitations for talks like this. There's a lot of interest in the research uh, that we do. Uh, but I don't study inequality because I I want there to be more of it. I study inequality because I want there to be less of it. And I think there should be less of it. Uh, and so I need to be careful about what I wish for. <laughs> right? I'm happy that there's interest, um, but I wish there was actually less inequality. Uh, I don't know if you can see it in the top left corner here, um, but this is the version of A Tale of Two Cities that uh, was released when Oprah picked it for her book club. Um, and I have to say, I find there, like, there's something just really ironic about that, right? about this billionaire choosing a book about uh, inequality, about political tension, about violence uh, uh, for her uh, book club.
fun fact about Oprah. My, this, is, this stumps my students all the time. Uh, we were just talking about the Forbes list of billionaires uh, and where Mackenzie Bezos would end up after the divorce. Anyone have an idea of where Oprah is on that list right now? Where does she rank in terms of her wealth? Any guesses? 856. Which is really low. That's much lower than I realized uh, Oprah would be on Forbes' list of billionaires. That means there's 855 people with fortunes bigger than her. Uh, her fortune is about $2.6 uh, billion right now. 855 people have uh, uh, fortunes bigger than that. Um, I mean, I think that's telling us something uh, not only about how much wealth there is above Oprah, right? There are 855 people with, with fortunes bigger than that, um, but also how little we know about them. Uh, we know Jeff Bezos, we know Bill Gates, we know the Kochs, and then there's about 840 people in there uh, that we really know very little about. Uh, so the news article that I really want to start with is one uh, that you may have seen a few weeks ago. It came out uh, on <laughs> Christmas Day. Um, so some of you might have had other things to be uh, doing that morning. Uh, but this was also in the New York Times about uh, uh, the relentlessness of modern parenting. Right? Uh, and the point of this article was to uh, spotlight uh, how different uh, child care expenditures are uh, across the income spectrum. Right? Uh, uh, it is uh, an article that I like because it conflates these two ideas of inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcome. The reason that people were concerned about this uh, was the sense that uh, that highest income quintile, uh, parents in that highest income quintile are spending much, much more on childcare, education, uh, and uh, uh, related services for their children. Right? Uh, and we can see in those bottom four quintiles uh, that families are actually spending much less on childcare. Um, it turns out that uh, the rich just have much more to spend, right? So that's part of what is going on here. Uh, the share of income that folks in the, the other four quintiles are spending on childcare has increased over time as well. Um, they just don't have as much uh, to spend. Um, but this conflates these two ideas of income inequality, uh, uh, sorry, of, uh, equality of opportunity and equality of uh, uh, outcome. <laughs> Um, uh, in, I think, some really nice ways, right? Um, because it represents that there are differences uh, in, say, parenting activities uh, in the amount of time and the amount of money that some parents are able to spend uh, on their kids and with their families, uh, just based on the amount of income uh, that they have. Uh, but there's also this concern that uh, perhaps because families at the top are going to be spending and investing much more in education and childcare and related services, that those kids in the future might get uh, 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 might get ahead, right? Uh, they might preserve in some way, uh, reproduce the advantages that they already have um, based on the family that they were born into. Um, so we see then both of these things, right? This idea that parents, uh, based on where they are in the income distribution, have much different amounts of money, um, but that those investments in kids right now could create different in unequal outcomes in the future. I've been mentioning inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcome. Let's just uh, uh, take a, a couple moments to uh, uh, define those two terms. Uh, because oftentimes these two terms are conflated, right? And they really are different. Um, uh, uh, and I think that uh, to get through the rest of what I want to talk about, remembering or clarifying the difference between these two uh, uh, it will, be, will be helpful. Uh, so let's talk about equality of opportunity first, right? Now imagine that uh, when I came here uh, tonight, uh, before anyone else, uh, showed up, imagine that I put a lottery ticket under all of your chairs, right? Uh, and it has a number on it. And in a moment, I'm going to pull a number from my computer, a random generator on my computer will give us a number. And whoever has the number on their ticket is going to win $1,000. Right? No, this is just hypothetical. This isn't going to happen. There are no, there are no numbers. There's definitely not $1,000. Uh, but because I didn't know who was going to be sitting where, uh, everyone has an equal chance of winning that lottery. Right? Uh, you might feel sad if you don't win, uh, but you probably won't feel that the game was rigged against you. You won't feel that it was an unfair game. But now imagine that I took 10 numbers in a row. And let's say that all 10 winners were in the front row. Now you might think that the game was rigged somehow. You wouldn't believe me that even if I told you that I knew where no one were, I didn't know where anyone was going to be sitting, uh, uh, if it just happened by chance that all winners of this lottery ended up in the front row, those of you who were in the back might be really concerned. You would be looking for some reason uh, why the system uh, was out to get you, right? Why you didn't have a fair chance at that lottery win, 
That's really what we think about when we think about inequality of opportunity, right? You want to feel like the game is fair. You want to feel like you have the same exact chance to win whatever outcome there is uh, compared to everyone else in the room. What do we think about when we think about the American dream? What we think about when we think about the American dream is really that idea of inequality of opportunity, right? We think that if you play by the rules, if you work hard, if you get a good education, you should be able to get ahead, right? Uh, that the game is not rigged, you should be able to do those things and get ahead. Uh, when we think about the American dream, we think about inequality of opportunity. We don't think as much about inequality of outcome, which is the question maybe some of you are thinking, which is why is it fair that someone's going to end up with $1,000 tonight and someone is not, right? That's inequality of outcome. I think we need to spend much more time and energy thinking about inequality of outcome than we do thinking about inequality of opportunity. Stop thinking about whether or not the game is rigged. Stop thinking about whether there are uh, equal chances to win unequal rewards. Let's start spending more time thinking about those unequal rewards. That is equality or inequality of outcome. So one of the big questions about uh, inequality today is what is the relationship between inequality of opportunity and inequality of outcome, right? This is why I started with that article about parenting. Um, if we think that there are some kids who are getting better advantages, better access to resources today, uh, because their parents, just, just because their parents have more money, uh, 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 what is the later outcome, uh, what is the later distribution of uh, advantages going to look like? Uh, the reason that this is a concern is because of something called the Great Gatsby Curve. Um, I don't know how many of you can uh, see this, but this is showing the relationship between income inequality and social mobility. Uh, we have income inequality on the uh, bottom, uh, going from low income inequality to high income inequality. And then this is a measure of social mobility uh, going from uh, uh, low to high as well. Uh, so this is showing uh, on the top left corner, the Nordic countries, right? Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, Finland. We tend to think that they have very low income inequality and very high social mobility. Down here, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, Peru, high income inequality, low social mobility. The U.S. is in the middle of this figure, a uh, place that uh, uh, relative to uh, the countries that are most like us socially and economically, historically, uh, we have pretty high income inequality. Um, compared to emerging economies, we actually have pretty low income inequality, right? Um, so we are uh, uh, just about in the middle of the uh, uh, income inequality measure here. Um, and we're about in the middle of the social mobility measure as well. Uh, there is this, uh, I should say one more thing, this uh, income inequality measure is, called, is uh, the Gini index. Uh, which some of you might be familiar with. It runs from zero to 100. Uh, if we had a genie of zero, it would mean that everyone had exactly the same share of national income. If we had a genie of 100, it would mean that there was one person who had all the income. Uh, so we're right around in the middle there, right? Uh, this uh, figure is showing that we're about 0.43, sorry, about 43 on the genie. Uh, genie for the US uh, last year, or in 2017, I should say, uh, was 0.48. Uh, so a bit higher than this. Vermont's uh, inequality measure, of uh, the Gini index for the state of Vermont, uh, is slightly lower than it is for the US. We have slightly less inequality in, in the state of Vermont, uh, at least based on this Gini index. Um, there is a lot of research right now trying to figure out what the exact relationship is between income inequality and social mobility. Uh, uh, we know that this pattern holds, that countries with more income inequality have less social mobility. We know that that holds uh, across countries. We do not know if it holds within countries over time. So what that means is that if we have increasing inequality in the United States, will we have less social mobility? We don't know that. We assume that right now because of charts like this, um, but we actually do not know as much about uh, the relationship between inequality and uh, mobility, inequality of outcome and inequality of opportunity within countries over time as we do uh, at a given point in time uh, uh, across uh, different countries. Why should we care though, even if we don't know for sure what the relationship is between inequality of opportunity uh, and inequality of outcome? I really like uh, uh, this uh, quote by uh, a British economist named Anthony Atkinson, who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, a real leading expert, I think, on the philosophy and the measurement of income inequality. Uh, and one of the things that Atkinson said uh, uh, was that uh, uh, inequality of outcome among today's generation is the source of the unfair advantage received by the next generation. If we are concerned about equality of opportunity tomorrow, we need to be concerned about inequality of outcome today.
again, I think when it comes really to the uh, American dream, we're thinking much more about leveling the playing field at the beginning, making sure that the system is not rigged. Um, but if we are, care about that in the future, we need to care about the inequality of outcomes, the inequality of resources, the inequality of income and wealth uh, 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 before we even start talking about leveling uh, the playing field for the next generation. This way of linking opportunity and inequality uh, has been really politically powerful, socially powerful, culturally powerful uh, for well over 100 years. Uh, uh, Barack Obama in 2014 um, gave a speech in uh, Osawatomie, Kansas, uh, when, where he was uh, kind of talking about income inequality and the threats of income inequality to democracy. Uh, he chose Osawatomie, Kansas because it is the site uh, of a very similar speech by Teddy Roosevelt in 2010. Um, so you have these two moments in American history uh, where there is uh, a, a concern about rising income inequality and what it might mean for the future of democracy, uh, for the future of uh, uh, opportunity and mobility, um, both happening in the same place. Uh, in the middle of the uh, country, um, in a place that uh, economically uh, looks very much like, uh, uh, like the rest of the United States. Uh, and what uh, Barack Obama said there was uh, he found a way to, again, uh, I think bring together income inequality and uh, opportunity. Uh, the gaping inequality gives lie to the promise that's at the very heart of America, that this is a place where you can make it if you try. Uh, and then talks about kids, right? Uh, we tell them that your children will have a chance uh, to do even better than you do. I came across this quote several years ago, right, in 2014. I remember uh, kind of really being excited about the speech. Uh, and then I kind of forgot about the quote. Um, but uh, I found myself thinking about it uh, a, a few months ago um, because I think it actually says a lot about our political discourse today. Uh, do we have uh, political leaders who could still uh, uh, make this speech? Right? Uh, what has happened to the way we process information? Uh, if uh, a political candidate got up and uh, uh, gave these remarks uh, talking about income inequality, would people respond in the way they might respond to a speech about climate change and call it fake news? Uh, would they try to deny it? Um, uh, which is what happens sometimes with income inequality speeches. Um, uh, there are attempts to find uh, alternative explanations or to say uh, that the causes and consequences are not as dire uh, 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 as the speech maker is giving. Um, that's not just kind of a, a comment about political discourse, right? I think it's actually a comment about inequality. Uh, because one of the things that uh, uh, researchers are starting to note today about income inequality, uh, I think it's happening in the United States. I think it's been happening since uh, Obama made that speech. We also saw that it was happening uh, the early part of the 20th century when Teddy Roosevelt uh, gave his, uh, was that when there is more income inequality, there is also more political tension. Uh, uh, so it is, not just, it is not just a coincidence that these two things are happening necessarily at the same time. Uh, Keith Payne, uh, in this book, The Broken Ladder, uh, really identifies this, right? Uh, he uh, uh, notices that uh, one of the effects of income inequality, it's not just that people might have a harder time paying their bills, it's that there is more political polarization, right? Uh, that it happens on the left and the right. People look for ways to make sense of a world that seems unfair. And often they do that by retreating into tribal identity whether it's political or religious or ethnic or whatever. That sounds like a pretty accurate diagnosis of our recent political history to me. Uh, and I think it sounds pretty alarming uh, about our political future. So let's go back to the question that Obama asked. Was Obama right about uh, identifying that underlying problem? Was he right uh, to suggest that perhaps because of the income inequality that we have today, children no longer have a chance to do even better than their parents? Uh, this is some work uh, uh, the, by uh, Ross Chetty, uh, who I was mentioning uh, earlier, uh, looking uh, over time, uh, over, uh, I don't know, about the last uh, 80 years, uh, looking at how likely it was that children born in given years would end up making more money than their parents by the time uh, they became 30, right? By the time they reached their 30th birthday, uh, did they have incomes higher or lower than their parents did at the same time? For Americans born in 1940, about 92% of them ended up, by the time they were 30, making more than their parents. That's a big number, right? 92%. It's basically everyone who was born in 1940, by the time they were 30 in 1970, uh, would be making more money than their parents did. Uh, you can see, so this is uh, showing this by uh, parents' income percentiles. What this is showing is that uh, folks who were born in 1940 to parents at the very lowest 
part of the income distribution, they were almost guaranteed that they would end up making more than their parents. Um, but even uh, kids who were born to uh, parents of the top 1%, right, the very, very top of the income distribution in 1940, still about 40% of them in 1970 were making more than their parents were making. I should say that this is uh, adjusting dollars, right? So this is uh, 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 certainly taking account of uh, how value of money changes over time. Uh, for the 1950 cohort, uh, we drop down to about 79% who end up, for folks who were born in 1950, uh, by the time they're 30, only 79% of them are making more than their parents. 1960, we're down to 62%. 1970, we're down to 60%. I should say, this is actually one of the most interesting things about this chart uh, to me, the fact that uh, we have pretty big jumps uh, for most of these decades, but we don't between 1960 uh, and 1970. Um, uh, that's a, if there are students here, I would tell you that that's a project that one of you should work on. Uh, maybe you have more time even than students, though. So this is a project that uh, <laughs> one of you uh, uh, should work on as well. Uh, so now the big question, right? What percentage uh, of students, of, not students, what percentage of people, what percentage of Americans, to be more specific, what percentage of Americans born in 1980 ended up making more than their parents in 2010 by the time they were 30? Any guesses? Very low. Exactly 50%. So for that cohort born in 1980, we're down to a 50% chance. That's a coin toss. People born in 1980 had an equal chance uh, of making more or less than their parents by the time they were 30. What does this look like for Vermont? I was kind of interested in these uh, numbers. This is just the percent earning more than their parents at age 30, uh, the national numbers versus the Vermont numbers. Uh, this is just the overall average, right? Uh, so in 1940, uh, about the same percentage of uh, Americans and the same percentage of Vermonters would end up making more than their parents. Vermonters ended up doing better than uh, Americans overall uh, until 1970. The really kind of fascinating thing uh, that we see here, though, is that for the cohort in Vermont born in 1980, uh, it was less likely that they would end up making more than their parents than it was for Americans overall. Right? So Vermont actually ended up being uh, about exactly uh, where Americans, where the national average was in 1940, higher than the national average in 1950, in 1960, but a bit lower than the national average for the most recent cohort uh, that is in this research. Now, there's a lot to think about here, right? A lot of things have changed since 1940. I think a really good point uh, 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 about just coming out of uh, World War II, right? Um, and I'll show you some uh, additional research later uh, that really identifies that moment in American history uh, as a unique one when it comes to income inequality. Uh, we know that a lot of other things have happened as well, right? Um, maybe 30 doesn't mean what it does anymore. Uh, what, maybe 30, I should say that differently, maybe 30 isn't what 30 was in 1940, right, or 1970. Um, I bet some of you probably have uh, kids or grandkids who are staying at home longer than you imagined they would, right? Um, uh, you knew that, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, um, by the time someone was 20 or 25, they should be uh, kind of firmly uh, established in society. Right? That doesn't happen anymore. Um, so maybe uh, it's not just a question of kind of the amount of money changing over time, but it's the social construction of age. Uh, the 30 is no longer really when we should be measuring economic independence or economic uh, stability. But the other thing that has changed is income inequality. Right? Uh, and I think that there is some, con I certainly have concern uh, that a lot of these numbers are really driven by income inequality. Either the fact that it just takes much more today to earn more than parents, right? If we're thinking about just the income distribution being much wider than it was in the past, uh, or perhaps because of this relationship between income inequality and mobility, uh, that if uh, uh, there is a hardening of class, if there is a hardening of income distributions uh, in this country, then we would expect to see less fluidity, right? We would expect to see uh, a, a smaller percentage of people being able to end up making more than their parents did at that same age. If that's true, Right? If this actually is telling us something about income inequality, then we're right back to this point, where I said we don't have much research now about how income inequality is affecting social mobility. Um, but if 
the suggestions that are out there are true, and we need to do much more research on this. We're back at a time like this uh, where we have a very, very strong relationship now within a country uh, uh, between income inequality and social mobility. All right, so what is another, um, uh, what's another effect of all of this, right? Um, part of this might be uh, political tension, political polarization, um, political tribalism uh, uh, along not just class uh, or economic lines, but uh, racial, ethnic, uh, uh, religious, or geographic lines uh, as well. Um, and then there's also the effect on health, right? And this is an area where I've been digging into more recently. And I thought that uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, you might be interested uh, in some of this research. This is research by Angus Deaton and Anne Case, uh, demographers uh, and economists uh, uh, down at Princeton University, uh, who have really looked at the relationship between uh, uh, income inequality and health. Um, uh, Deaton has looked at this uh, globally and historically, right? So not just focused on the US, uh, really thinking about uh, kind of, OK, in China or India, right? Uh, as uh, millions of people are brought out of poverty, we see that health uh, is uh, increasing there. Right? Uh, we see that health outcomes uh, in most of the world as economic development occurs uh, uh, are improving. Um, but then he started looking really, uh, uh, well, what does it mean within a country right? uh, uh, about health uh, when inequality is increasing? You need a life to have a good life. Right? Um, so if we're going to be looking at some kind of outcomes related to inequality, health is a really good place to start. Let me skip to what he is, uh, uh, what uh, he uh, and, and Case are uh, looking at here. Uh, this is, uh, again, some historic uh, work looking from uh, about 1990 to uh, the early 2010s on uh, deaths per 100,000 people. That red line at the top that has been increasing since the mid 90s is US whites, middle aged. Uh, white Americans. Uh, and then these are national averages for France, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and Sweden. USH is uh, US Hispanics. Um, so deaths per 100,000 uh, have been decreasing for Hispanics over time, um, but increasing certainly since, uh, say, the late 1990s for US whites. You'll notice that African Americans are not on this chart, right? And that's one of the criticisms that Case and Deaton have gotten of this work and of this chart specifically. If African Americans were included, they would be much higher than this, right? Um, so they are excluded, um, uh, really not for any other reason than to make the chart somewhat readable. Uh, uh, but that's not, I think, a good enough excuse. So I just want to point that, I want to point that out now. Um, but this is really unusual, right? Uh, U.S. whites uh, have been dying at unexpected numbers since about the 1990s, really middle-aged whites in uh, um, mostly rural areas, not to scare, not to scare anyone. Um, uh, but why, why, would this be, why would this be happening? Uh, the uh, cause of death that has been increasing uh, is the uh, category that the CDC calls poisonings. Uh, this is uh, alcohol poisoning. Uh, it is uh, drug abuse. Um, uh, it is uh, more specifically uh, opiate, op opiate uh, related uh, poisonings. Right? Um, uh, and so the concern here uh, that Deaton and uh, friends are trying to uh, now figure out is why has this skyrocketed so much really within this population? Uh, and he's connecting this in some ways, they're connecting this in some ways to that research we were just looking at about uh, cohort probability of earning more than parents. Uh, and what they say is that although the epidemic of pain, suicide, and drug overdoses, they call these deaths of despair, uh, preceded the financial crisis, ties to economic insecurity are possible. After the productivity slowdown in the early 1970s with widening income inequality, many of the baby boom generation are the first to find in midlife that they will not be better off than were their parents. Right? Now, that's not a direct reason why people would die. It's not a direct reason why people would uh, 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 become addicted to uh, opiates or other kinds of drugs. Right? I don't think that's what they're saying. I think what they're pointing out uh, is that there is perhaps this additional economic anxiety that is related in some way to stress. Maybe it's related to the loss of a job, and that's related to health care and all these other things. Right? There are many different pathways that we can imagine here. Um, but I wanted to uh, uh, point this out specifically because I thought that it was a, uh, one way to connect an outcome that is surprising to those cohort trends over time. 
So we looked uh, you know, uh, at this idea of the probability of making more than your parents uh, by the time you're 30 and how that's been changing over time. Let's look just right now. Let's just do a snapshot of the United States uh, uh, at some different inequality statistics. Um, now, there are a lot of different ways to measure inequality. Um, uh, it sounds like some of you know a lot about these already. We've already looked at the Gini uh, statistic, for example. Um, I'm going to give you some statistics about the top 1%, right? Um, really, because uh, I think politically, when people think about uh, income inequality, um, they're thinking about this distinction between the top 1% and the bottom 99%, right? The top 1% and everyone else. Uh, but I think also that, when, that, that we can't ignore the top 1% when we think about income inequality. It is not just a political uh, phraseology, right? It is not a uh, just kind of nice political target. Uh, what is happening with the top 1% is, in a lot of ways, an explanation for the inequality that we have. Um, let's take a look at the uh, uh, just some statistics about income inequality in the United States. This, again, is from that new Gilded Age age report um, by uh, the Economic Policy Institute that I mentioned. Uh, what do we uh, see here? These are the two boxes in particular that I really want uh, 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 you to focus on, that one and this one. So uh, average annual income for top 1% in the United States is about $1.3 million, just to give you a sense of what it really takes. Uh, but that's the average, right? Anyone with an income higher than, uh, a household income higher than $420,000 right now uh, would be in the top 1%. Overall, nationally, uh, the top 1% makes 26.3 times the income of the bottom 99%. Uh, and the top 1% takes home 20%, uh, sorry, 21% of all the income in the United States. We're in the Northeast region, between the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, uh, uh, and the West. The Northeast is the most unequal part of the country, uh, really because we have uh, DC, uh, New York and Boston, which are three of the most unequal places in the country. Uh, if we're just looking at the Northeast, uh, the top 1% makes about 32 and a half times the income of the bottom 99%, uh, and they take home about 24.7, about 25%, about a quarter of all income. The top 1% in the Northeast take home, one, take home a quarter of all the income in the Northeast. What does this look like in Vermont? Uh, Vermont, we rank about 43rd out of 50 uh, on these measures of income inequality. Uh, but that still is only telling us, right? That's not telling us that the top 1% are taking home 1% of the income. That's telling us the top 1% are taking home about 14% of income in Vermont. Uh, and uh, uh, the top 1% uh, have uh, an average income of about 16 times uh, the income of the bottom 99%. Uh, that was somewhat surprising for me, I think, in terms of just thinking about Vermont. Um, uh, Vermont, like I said, is, is uh, pretty low on this chart, right? 43rd out of 50. Uh, New York, DC, Florida, California uh, are, are the other, uh, uh, are the places that are uh, much, much bigger. Uh, let's take a look at this over time, right? Um, so we were talking before about what was happening in the 1940s. This is a, uh, those, has anyone here looked at, uh, say, Thomas Piketty's work? Uh, on capital, this is the, he has uh, charts like this that are very, very uh, similar, right? Uh, uh, this is the classic, what's called the U-shaped curve of income inequality. Uh, looking at the, the amount of national income going to the top 1% over time, right? So this is the United States. Uh, we see in uh, about 1920 and 1930, uh, there was a peak, right? Uh, where they were taking home uh, about 25% of national income. Uh, that decreases uh, in the middle part of the 20th century, largely because of the post-war uh, growth, right? Uh, uh, the uh, economic um, security for many Americans, not all Americans, but the economic, in, uh, the economic security and growth, uh, much of it uh, produced by uh, military expenditures, right? Uh, the Cold War did really good things for income inequality, it turns out. Uh, but the middle part of the 20th century, we have what is so known in some ways as the Great Compression, right? Uh, uh, where there's much less income inequality in the United States states than there is historically. Um, that changes uh, uh, around 1980. Uh, and since 1980, uh, the top 1% has uh, been increasing the amount of uh, all income that they have been taking home. Uh, there are reasons uh, uh, to think about why this started in the 1980s. Uh, the decline of union membership, uh, the changes uh, in tax cuts uh, as uh, implemented by the Reagan administration, uh, and then a change in uh, just cultural norms about CEO. Okay. 
right? Uh, the rise of top incomes, the idea uh, that if you are a CEO, you should be able to take home much more money than you were in the 1950s, right? Uh, there was a cultural change at that time, not just a systemic change, uh, not just a structural change that we need uh, to be thinking about. Um, but this U-shaped curve, right? Uh, so I'm showing you this for the share of uh, all income that's going to the top 1%. If we look to the top 10%, if we look to the top 20%, uh, the, a very similar shape would emerge. Right? Uh, really on any kind of income inequality measure, if we're looking at the US um, from the 1920s to the 2020s, uh, this U-shaped curve uh, uh, repeats itself over and over and over. What does this look like in Vermont? I pulled these numbers for us. Uh, slightly lower than the, the national shares. Right. Um, so in, during uh, across this period in Vermont, the top 1% was taking home slightly less of all Vermont's income, um, but still in a U-shaped pattern. Right? Uh, they took home more in the 1920s and 30s, uh, much less in the 40s and 50s, 60s, uh, 70s, and then starting around the 1980s uh, in increase uh, again. I said that the Northeast is the most unequal region in the United States. We can see that as well uh, with this uh, chart, and E here being for New England and not Nebraska. Um, uh, again, the U-shaped curve uh, is very, very dominant. I've been talking about Vermont as a state. Um, I want just very quickly, uh, and we can come back to this later in some questions if you have them, um, I want just very quickly to look at some uh, differences within the state of Vermont when it comes to uh, some inequality uh, uh, measures and some income measures. Uh, median household income, slightly less uh, in Vermont than it is nationally. Nationally, it's 60,336 median household income for uh, 2017. Uh, Vermont is 57.5, uh, but pretty big differences within the state, right? So Chittenden County is the highest. Essex County is the lowest. Chittenden County is about 1.75 times, right? About 75% uh, higher median household income in Chittenden County, uh, as there is in Essex County in the top, uh, in the far uh, northeast part of the state. Bennington County, so I pulled out Bennington County um, uh, on each of these uh, slides just for, uh, just for some comparison. Uh, Bennington County ranks 10th out of Vermont's 14 counties uh, in terms of median income. Uh, median income of $52,251, about $5,000 less than the Vermont median. Uh, how much more is the top 1% making compared to the bottom 99%? Uh, again, the United States number is 26 times. Uh, Vermont, yeah, these should be times, sorry, those first two instead of percent. Uh, United States 26 times, Vermont 16 times. Uh, Lamoille County is uh, on this measure by far the most unequal county uh, in, uh, uh, in Vermont. Uh, the top 1% in Lamoille County are making 24 times the bottom 99% compared to Essex County where it is just nine times. Bennington County on this one is actually much higher, right? Um, so there is more income inequality in Bennington than we would expect based on the median income. Yeah, not surprising at all. Uh, uh, not surprising at all. Um, uh, I, if, if anything, the surprising thing was that it's not number one, right? Um, uh, but that's a different uh, conversation. The top 1% share of all income, United States 21%, Vermont 14%, again, Lamoille County, just about 20%, uh, Essex, down at 8%, and again, Bennington is second on this measure as well. So in Bennington County, uh, the top 1% are bringing home about 18% of all income. It's still lower than it is in the United States, um, but higher than the Vermont average. This is just telling us something about the top 1%, remember? Uh, if uh, uh, there are good reasons, I think, politically, um, but also empirically to be thinking about the top 1%, right? The difference between uh, economic outcomes of the top 1% uh, and the bottom 99%. It is not just, again, this political uh, rallying cry. Um, but it is a, a successful political rallying cry. There are some researchers who are concerned uh, that the emphasis on this uh, distinction that people make between the top 1% and everyone else uh, uh, is actually ignoring the other problems uh, throughout the income distribution, right? Um, so Richard Reeves, uh, some of you uh, may know this book, Dream Hoarders. Uh, Richard Reeves says, you know what, the problem is not the top 1%. The problem is the top 20%. Uh, and I bet most of us are going to end up in the top 20%, right? And he's saying it's that top 20% that is really to blame uh, for the problems of economic inequality and perhaps diminish social mobility in this country. Um, he's saying that uh, 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 it is really the top fifth of the country uh, that saw uh, the biggest income increases uh, from 1980 to 2013. Uh, and actually, if you look at uh, kind of the differences between, say, folks at the middle of the income distribution and folks at the bottom, that income inequality has not been increasing over time. 
right? The only income inequality that has really been increasing over time is between, say, the top 20% and everyone else. If we look at within the top 20%, it's really the top 1%. But there are reasons to think um, uh, that we need to get uh, beyond just talking about the top 1%. Very quickly, a couple other things just about income inequality, because I think uh, looking nationally is only so helpful. I think uh, even just looking at a state is only so helpful. Even looking at a county is only so helpful. We need to look at groups within uh, these different geographic regions. Uh, the greatest income inequality in the United States, if we think about racial or ethnic groups, is uh, among Asian Americans. Uh, this is surprising often to a lot of my students, right, who assume that it is uh, African Americans. Uh, African Americans for most of the 20th century uh, had the highest uh, within group income inequality. Uh, but that has changed uh, uh, in very recent, uh, very recent years. Uh, the thing to keep in mind, though, whenever we're thinking about, uh, whenever we're thinking about Asian Americans in general, um, but uh, especially when we're thinking about economic outcomes, is how much variation there is within uh, the Asian American population. Um, uh, so while uh, Indian, Japanese, uh, Chinese uh, wages uh, overall are uh, pretty good uh, and much higher than uh, they are for uh, whites, blacks, and Hispanics, when we look at other groups, uh, really the most recent uh, Asian, uh, uh, sorry, the oldest in, uh, in some ways, I guess the, the kind of late uh, 20th century uh, groups that were arriving uh, much lower wages, right? Uh, Filipino, Vietnamese uh, 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 groups um, have much lower uh, median incomes than do uh, the most recent uh, immigrant groups, right? Uh, uh, Indian, uh, Japanese, uh, and Chinese. Uh, I haven't said anything about wealth, um, but thinking about racial differences in income inequality uh, necessitates a conversation about racial differences in wealth. Uh, why is wealth important? Let's just think about that for a second. Why shift from thinking about income uh, to, to wealth? Uh, I think of wealth as a safety net. I think of wealth as a cushion for downward mobility. I think of wealth as a reason why uh, if there is a government shutdown and you are a federal worker, you might not have to worry about not getting that paycheck for a couple of weeks. Because you have money saved away. Uh, 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 when there is not wealth, there is much more economic insecurity and anxiety, regardless of income inequality. Right? Um, it's important to think about them. Uh, uh, re uh, uh, important to think about them separately. Most wealth comes from home ownership in this country. So a lot of these numbers are really just explained by differential home ownership rates. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about uh, wealth that I'll just uh, uh, mention very briefly is that it can be transferred across generations in a way that income cannot. Right? Um, uh, so if we're thinking about, uh, in some ways, those like social uh, age gradients, the social milestones in life, uh, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, if you were going to own a house at some point, you would have had that house by the time you were 30. Um, that, is not the tr that is not true anymore, for lots of different reasons. Um, but that's part, uh, perhaps, of why, uh, 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 why wealth uh, inequality looks very different today than it has uh, in the past. Um, younger. Professionals have much less wealth today than they did in the past. Um, that's largely, I think, because of home ownership transfer differences. Older people are living longer, right? Which is good for a lot of reasons. Um, but it means that in some ways, the wealth transmission pathways that, that have taken place in this country in the past um, uh, don't exist in the same way. Uh, just to come back uh, to think about wealth in terms of uh, that Forbes list of billionaires, right? I really like that Forbes list of billionaires. Uh, I want to get there. I want to like have this vision of getting all their autographs one day uh, on the, the Forbes magazine list. Uh, but the Forbes 400 richest Americans own more wealth than all black households plus a quarter of Latino households. Right? Um, it is hard to overstate these differences. Uh, and it's hard to identify only one cause of them. We could think about education, we could think about poverty, we could think about home ownership, we could think about health, we could think about jobs. Uh, it's a combination of all of those things, right? Um, so some attempt to only fix one of those things is not going to do it. Um, this is going to require much more uh, systemic uh, work. This question that I think about a lot and that my students really challenge me on is, uh, all right, there's all this income inequality, but isn't the real problem poverty? Shouldn't we just focus on poverty? If we just got more people in this country out of poverty, uh, we wouldn't have to worry as much about income inequality overall. Uh, I think there are good 
reasons to think that. Um, I don't think they're good enough. Uh, uh, I think we have to think about poverty much, uh, poverty and inequality together, right? I think just focusing on poverty uh, is not really going to help us. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, you, I bet you uh, know some of these numbers as well. Uh, but just looking at the poverty rate within uh, Vermont, right? Uh, Vermont's uh, overall poverty rate is slightly less than the national average, um, but that uh, masks the fact that there are parts of, the, of our state uh, that have more poverty than the country overall. Uh, uh, Grand Isle now is the place with uh, the least, uh, the lowest rate of poverty, with Bennington ranking about fifth, just under the national average, right? Just under the national average. Uh, again, I'll come back to uh, thinking about uh, Anthony Atkinson's work uh, 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 about thinking about whether we should just focus on poverty, right? He was the guy uh, much earlier who said we shouldn't just focus on inequality of opportunity. If we care about inequality of opportunity, we need to think about inequality of outcome. Uh, and I think he's saying something in some similar ways here about poverty. Uh, we shouldn't just focus on poverty. Right? Poverty is about relationships between the rich and the poor. Uh, and when rich people think about poverty as the problem, uh, it's very easy to think that poor people are thinking that richness is the problem. Uh, and if we think about this in terms of mutual interdependence, uh, uh, I think we'll be uh, uh, much, much richer intellectually and socially as a result. If you have not read Matt Desmond's book, Evicted, I strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, it is probably the book. It is the book right now that shows up on every one of my syllabi. Um, uh, I find a way to sneak it in to every class. Um, I'm teaching research methods this upcoming semester, uh, and he has this really amazing, people don't believe me when I say this, but this really amazing methodological appendix, um, which you should not skip if you read this book, uh, where he describes how he got into this project. Uh, and one of the things he says uh, in this section is that he wanted to excuse me, try to write a book about poverty that didn't focus exclusively on poor people or poor places. He wanted to look for something uh, that brought rich people or richer people and poor people together and found eviction, uh, people being forced out of their houses, uh, uh, forced out of their apartments more often, uh, as a, a process, as a social and economic process that brings uh, poor people and rich people together, right? Uh, in a market-based way uh, of thinking about uh, what those relationships are. Um, I think it's a really fantastic book, but especially especially this insight uh, 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 of stopping thinking about just poverty, stopping thinking just about poor people, thinking about the relationship between richer people and poor people. Uh, I think that's a really important thing uh, for all of us to do in the future. Uh, I'm going to show you just a couple of things about education. I get really excited about education, higher education, so I could talk about this for a long time. I don't know if you're as excited. Um, so I'll just show you these things, and then if you have questions about it, we can uh, uh, talk about it a bit more. Um, but this idea about a relationship between poor people and rich people got me thinking about how a lot of philanthropy related to education is done, right? Uh, education, for good or bad, has become, or education funding, for good or bad, has become a relationship between poor people and rich people. Uh, the new uh, tech billionaires in particular are really excited about spending money on education. Right? They think that uh, if they are in some ways responsible for the amount of income inequality that we have today, uh, they should be also responsible for fixing it. But the really big way that they imagine fixing income inequality is by improving education, right? or at least throwing money at schools, which they think is the same thing. Uh, it turns out it's not uh, uh, that easy. Um, uh, but I think kind of this idea of uh, rich people and poor people together in education is an interesting one. Uh, some of you might have seen these numbers. This is work, uh, again, by Rush. Chetty and Friends uh, that was published, parts of it were published in the New York Times a few years ago, um, but looking at uh, uh, colleges and universities across the United States uh, and the income inequality of students, right? Uh, uh, what proportion of uh, colleges and university students come from the top 1%, come from the top 20%, uh, uh, come from the uh, bottom 60%. Middlebury uh, has some work to do. Uh, Middlebury uh, in this year, I think this was the, this was the, or like the class of 2013, uh, Middlebury was one of, I believe, eight institutions uh, to have more students from the top 1% than from the bottom 60% of the national income distribution. Uh, uh, UVM uh, has more students from the top 20% from the bottom 60%, uh, as does Bennington College, right? Uh, is anyone here from Bennington College or know Bennington College? 
I mean, you must know of Bennington College. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, but who, who would kind of be able to explain these numbers? I have to say, I don't know much about Bennington College. Digging into these numbers over the last few days, I really want to get, no, to, get to know it more um, because I find it so interesting. Um, uh, I should say the one thing that is, uh, I think, explaining some of these numbers for Bennington College is uh, it's really, really small size. Right? So when we're thinking about percentages, at a school with 200 people in a class, you don't need that much change to be able to have a really, uh, uh, that many people change uh, uh, for a really big percentage change. Right? Uh, Middlebury is about 2,500 students. It's about three times the size of Bennington. Um, uh, uh, so we can have some more uh, numerical difference uh, before we have the same kind of percentage, uh, the same kind of percentage difference. Um, uh, but this idea of, uh, uh, maybe this is where I'll uh, wrap up. Um, this uh, kind of the concerns that you might have here, the concerns that uh, this research has sparked nationally, uh, are really about equality of opportunity. Right? Um, so gosh, we need to make sure uh, that more students from the bottom 60%, the more, more students from the bottom 20% of the national income distribution are able to get to uh, colleges and universities. Right? That's been kind of the rallying cry that has come from a lot of this research. That is a question and a concern that is completely valid, but is only about that question of equality of opportunity. I think that we cannot uh, look at these numbers without also looking at these numbers, which is where graduates across the income distribution from these different colleges and institutions end up. Middlebury is sending 11% of its students to the top 1% nationally. It's sending 55% of its students to the top 20% nationally. If we're really concerned about income inequality, just bringing in more low-income students isn't going to be the fix. We have to think much more creatively. We have to think much more broadly about what kind of inequality our graduates are producing in the world. Um, because low-income students that we're bringing in, that all these colleges and universities are bringing in, are doing just as well after graduation as their richest counterparts. Um, so it cannot just be a question of income uh, inequality at the beginning. It cannot just be an access issue. If we are really concerned about income inequality, colleges and universities need to think about the income, income inequality our graduates produce when they get those jobs on Wall Street, when they become those CEOs. Uh, we cannot just think about our uh, responsibilities to admit uh, more economically diverse students. Uh, I will stop there. Maybe you'll have some questions about the possible solutions uh, to income inequality. I'd love to hear your solutions more than the ones I brought, um, because mine, the ones I brought are probably not that great. Um, but I uh, would be happy to hear uh, any uh, proposed solutions that you have or any questions or comments you have overall. Just to just give you a quick preview of two of the solutions, I had a difference in some ways between a universal basic income and a federal jobs guarantee. Right? Are we just going to redistribute that money and give that money in, for, in the form of universal basic income? Which is what there are some experiments trying to do that right now, most notably in Stockton, California? Um, or is there this more uh, ambitious but actually cheaper way of spreading opportunity, which would be some kind of federal jobs guarantee? Right? I would, I'm more in favor of federal jobs guarantee. Don't take their money. Let's create jobs. Uh, let's make sure that everyone uh, who needs a job or who can, wants a job is able to get one. I agree. Uh, so questions about, uh, you know, the, uh, should we be pushing college for all, right? Uh, is, that, is that really going to help uh, uh, this situation? Um, I, uh, so I would push it even back further in schooling. I would say that uh, it's not just community colleges that, that should be uh, doing more or, or uh, be allowed to do more, <laughs> but it's perhaps more accurate. Uh, high schools can also be doing s some different things, right? So this idea of kind of sending everyone to college has really changed what a high school is today. Um, a, a lot of that uh, trade development, trade skill development, that was happening, say, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, where we had much lower inequality. That wasn't happening in separate schools. That was happening within high schools. Uh, and so we need to be rethinking high school education as much as we're rethinking community colleges. Um, the reason, like, th so there's one other reason that I would say that colleges and universities should not be exempt from this conversation. Um, and that's because they are uh, complicit uh, in this idea of credential creep, right? Uh, the idea that uh, there are jobs in the past that didn't require uh, college educations that still might not require college skills, uh, but they but the employers are looking for people with college degrees, right? Uh, uh, that is a big uh, part of this problem, and I think colleges and universities are a part uh, of that as well, right? Colleges and universities want people around in jobs that don't require college degrees, but they want to hire people with college degrees, right? Because it just establishes some kind of norm uh, of uh, college education on those campuses. Um, if we're thinking about employers changing who they're hiring uh, and saying that they're, if a job does doesn't really need college degree, uh, then we shouldn't just be hiring someone with a college degree. I want colleges and universities to be doing that more than anyone else.
And there are lots of countries that have different, say, apprenticeship type programs, right? Um, uh, I think that is a, a perhaps a much uh, more valuable way of thinking about uh, reforming the education system right now than, say, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg giving uh, public school districts a lot of money to make sure that their students are college ready. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this goes back to uh, the cultural importance of the American dream. Right um, uh, in the 19th century, uh, getting more education meant, by and large, that you were able to get ahead, that you were able to get further ahead. Right? That's not necessarily true anymore. Um, but we still have this idea that if you are uh, getting ahead, then you must be really smart. Right? And if you're really smart, then you must be going to college. Um, we kind of have this uh, cultural imagination of all those things being thrown together. That you work, if you work really hard, uh, then you're going to get more education. If you're smart, you're going to get more education, um, and then you're going to get a better job. That means that if you don't have a better job, you either didn't work that hard or you weren't that smart. Right? Uh, we need to change uh, kind of our cultural frame of throwing all those different things together. It, it is going to be uh, huge. So AI, uh, the effect of AI, AI being artificial intelligence, um, I think, right? Is that the AI you're thinking about? Okay. Uh, uh, so AI is going to, so the, the question of automation, right, uh, in general, right? If, if the robots end up taking the jobs that you're talking about, uh, what happens to all the people who, um, who aren't, who aren't in those jobs now, but um, uh, who could be. Um, I think there is, uh, so folks at the uh, Economic Policy Institute, right, I pulled some uh, uh, work from there. Larry Michel, who was the president of the EPI, um, uh, who stepped down and someone new uh, is here. Uh, I think he's really compelling on saying that the robotic fear, the automation fear, is uh, overhyped. Right? Um, uh, that the uh, jobs that are going to be really well paying um, are, uh, are not going to go away. Right? Um, uh, that there are still going to be uh, jobs that require human creativity. There are still going to be jobs that require imagination, that require people skills. Uh, and robots are not going to be able to do that work. Right? Um, uh, and so if we only think about an automated inequality, we're going to end up uh, very quickly in this world that uh, uh, kind of the Silicon Valley tech uh, Billionaires are concerned about where we need universal basic income, right? Uh, where uh, we just stop thinking about inequality as a problem because we just assume it's going to exist. Um, I don't, I'm not ready to uh, jump on that bandwagon yet, right? I think we can still reduce inequality. I think it's a choice. Um, I don't think it's something that uh, uh, we're going to uh, always have to deal with if we decide not to. Um, so the robot. Automation issue, uh, I think, is uh, one still worth thinking about, but I'm convinced by a lot of the research that suggests uh, it's not as, uh, uh, not as dire uh, as we've thought over the last couple decades. Yeah, sure. So social mobility is, uh, so I'm a sociologist. The way sociologists think about social mobility is really about class. Uh, uh, about uh, kind of moving from, say, the lower class to the upper class, right? Um, when we think about social mobility today, we're usually actually thinking about income mobility. Um, the probability of, say, moving from the bottom 20% uh, to the top 20%. Right? Uh, we think that income inequality could be making the probability of that move much harder um, uh, because of the very simple thing that the, you have to go much further now to go from the bottom 20% to the top 20% um, uh, because the income distribution is being pulled uh, like ladders on a, like rungs on a ladder much further apart from each other. Um, so the very idea of needing to make much more money to jump quintiles uh, is a real reason to think that's, that that kind of income mobility is going to be much less uh, in the future than it is today. There is, so I could have done this whole talk. Uh, uh, so there's, I don't know if it's on the, I don't think the Times took up this piece. But if you go to that Opportunity Insights, opportunityinsights.org, um, they have this brand new thing called the Opportunity Atlas, where you can actually put in your home address, uh, find your census tract, and it will show for your specific census tract the probability uh, of a kid born, I think, in 1980, uh, moving a kid born into the bottom quintile in 1980 in your on your street, basically, uh, the probability that they would end up by the time they're 30 in the top 20%. Um, I didn't bring that today because it is so micro level. right? It's really fantastic. If I knew all of your home addresses, um, uh, maybe this is where AI could help. <laughs> uh, I would have I prepared this for you. Uh, but I would recommend uh, going to that opportunityinsights.org page for that.
I, I have international students. Um, Middlebury is actually very well known for our international, our international programs. I love having international students in class. Um, what do I hear from my students? So this question about shouldn't we just focus on poverty comes up a lot with my students. Um, uh, this question about we should make sure that uh, uh, we're focusing on uh, access to college rather than kind of unequal returns of college graduates, right? They don't seem to think that the unequal returns of college graduates are a problem that we should really be focusing on. As long as we get people into college, um, then the idea of meritocracy should hold. Um, uh, that, by and large, is uh, something that, that students feel. Um, there's a lot of kind of variation there. Um, students in the sociology department and so sociology departments overall tend to be more critical of uh, social structures. <laughs> um, uh, they, they are more concerned about inequality than some students I have from other departments. Um, I, I will say that kind of having done this work um, now for a while, um, college students are much more engaged with income inequality today than they were a decade ago, right? Part of that, I think, is just because the economic system has changed. Um, but part of it, I think, is because uh, we are talking just much more about income inequality than we are, uh, than we were in the past. Well, without political change, uh, how do we reduce income inequality? Is that the, that the question? Um, so you know, I've, I've said a couple times uh, now that I think uh, we need to keep in mind that income inequality is a choice. Right? Um, that we could have decided in 1980 uh, that we weren't going to change the tax system, um, that we were going to have things in place uh, so that CEO take home pay wouldn't uh, uh, change, uh, that we would uh, make sure that uh, kind of union uh, deterioration didn't happen at the systemic, in the systemic ways that it did. Right? Um, there were political things that could have happened, uh, I think, in the past. Um, I actually believe that the answers are not necessarily political right now. Right? Um, uh, uh, I wanted uh, kind of at the very end to come back to that parenting article that I started with tonight. Right? Um, I think we can think um, on a much smaller scale about what we do in our own families and in our own households. Um, there's work by Rachel Sherman, uh, who has, uh, I think, probably the best book on inequality I've read in the last couple of years. It's called Uneasy Street. Um, and she looks at uh, top 1% families in New York, right? Um, kind of every stereotype you would have of the top 1% in Manhattan, um, uh, those are these families. Um, and she really kind of does this amazing ethnographic work with these families thinking about how they talk to their kids uh, about being rich. Right? Um, and what she's finding is that these parents are talking to their kids about um, uh, 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 kind of being moral people, right? Um, being really good people. Um, so don't be a brat just because you uh, are in the top 1%, right? You have to do good in the world. Um, uh, and what she's finding is that that actually legitimates inequality more than it uh, attempts to, to challenge it. Um, because you're saying that there are some people who deserve uh, to be rich and there are some who don't. Right? If some of these parents say, you know what, you're only going to uh, get that car at the end of the year if you get a 3.5 GPA, um, that is only reinforcing this idea that uh, smart people who work hard should get some kind of reward. Right? Um, so she's actually looking much more inside families, inside households, and saying, the way we talk about uh, rewards and privileges for our own kids, uh, we need to be much more cognizant of how those are actually reinforcing these cultural themes uh, uh, that you are just raising as potential challenges. I think that's a much uh, harder thing to do. Um, but. Uh, we don't have to wait for uh, the government shutdown to end to start doing that in our own homes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the basic theory that you're talking about is uh, pretty different from the way that we've always thought the world worked. Right? We always thought that when there was some kind of radical economic development, uh, inequality would increase for a time. Um, because, say, the people who own the computers or who own the technology, who own the patents, they would get really rich off of it. Right? And then that economic development would kind of peak, uh, and there would be some more flourishing of whatever that economic or infrastructure change was. Right? And then inequality would decline. That historically has been what we've seen. Uh, we saw that at the end of the 19th century. We've seen that uh, much earlier as well. This is Piketty's big argument. Right? This is what's known as the Kuznets curve. Inequality, when there's economic development, inequality increases, and then it decreases. Uh, what we're seeing now is that it is not decreasing. Right? We have a kind of economic development, a kind of uh, technological advancement um, that is similar in some ways in terms of inequality as, as other moments in history. Um, it is supposed to reduce in, in, inequality at some point. It is not now. Right? So we need to be thinking about this as a very different world. I agree on that point um, that we need to think of this as a very different world. But we know that in the past, technological advancement and economic development have been associated with inequality at the beginning and less inequality at the end. 
um, I still think that there's a possibility of that happening this time uh, if we decide to try it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I guess the, the other question about this, this political issue, though, is that uh, does it have to be at the federal level? Right. What can state governments do? What can local in fact, what can local governments in do? At the state level. Right. Uh, and so, like, I, I, I agree that the federal government is totally dysfunctional and probably is not going to fix this really soon uh, in a way that makes most of us really happy. Right. Um, I think there are things that local governments can be doing, uh, thinking like what kind of zoning restrictions are there um, if we had more uh, mixed use development. Right. A very kind of local issue. Um, uh, would we be able to uh, have more uh, or have less economic segregation in our cities or towns or our villages. Right. Um, that's not something that uh, the president is going to uh, implement. That is something that local uh, groups can. Um, uh, and so I agree that political solutions have to be part of this, um, uh, but I'm, I'm hesitant to say, and I know that you're not saying this, um, but I just to uh, kind of, I'm hesitant to say that political solutions have to come from the federal government. So I think what you're, you're talking about is this, uh, so you said two things that I think are really important. First uh, is this idea of uh, more jobs, right, um, with higher wages. So a federal jobs guarantee, uh, the big kind of plans around federal jobs guarantees usually come with an increase uh, to the minimum wage or an increase to uh, social benefits. I think that that, is, that makes a lot of sense. The federal jobs guarantee uh, proposals that are out there right now uh, in some ways are related to uh, either infrastructure or uh, kind of the, the green economy, right? Um, uh, can we put people to work? Uh, reducing uh, the fears or potential dangers of climate change. Um, I think that is a really good way to think about what we were doing in the 1930s and 40s around, say, the Works Progress Administration, right? Something like that today, um, uh, I think, is worth talking about. The other thing you mentioned is uh, kind of policies related to wealth rather than income. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I had kind of spent more time talking about the differences between wealth and income in this talk um, because wealth inequality and income inequality require different responses. Um, uh, so aside from uh, kind of something like the federal jobs guarantee, which I think is more targeted at income inequality than wealth inequality, um, there are proposals like this. This is known as a baby bond, um, which is targeting specifically wealth inequality, right? Um, where the uh, kind of amount that every kid born in the U.S. would get in a uh, account uh, would vary based on how uh, much wealth their family has. Um, and additional money would be put into that account every year. The kid could not spend any of that money until they're 18. Right? Um, so lower income kids would have much more money in that account because it would be scaled to family income uh, than higher income kids. Then they could use it for uh, a down payment on a home. Right? If we know that that's the really big source of wealth inequality in this country, having access to that money uh, 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 could make a lot of sense. Maybe they spend it on uh, college education or some other kind of education. This is a proposal that uh, some candidates are talking about. Um, uh, it's really based on, on research, which I like. Right? I always like these policy proposals that are actually based on research. Um, uh, and this is, this is one. Uh, this is right now most closely associated with Cory Booker um, uh, in his uh, platform. But we'll have to see if other, if other candidates pick it up. I know I'm just about out of time. I just want to end with one uh, thing. And you'll uh, perhaps remember that I started the talk saying that for inequality researchers, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Um, many people just remember that line from A Tale of Two Cities. Um, I want to read the rest of this paragraph. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness, the spring of hope. The winter of despair, that one rings true right now. Uh, we had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Again, I think we need to keep in mind that inequality is a choice, right? Whether it's a political choice at the national level, at the local level, uh, or whether it's a choice about how we talk to our own kids and grandkids. So whether we choose wisdom or foolishness, whether we choose light or darkness, whether we choose uh, whether we have everything or nothing is up to us. Thank you.